how much of this bill is based on facts and, res- and oh, responsive boy. to facts compared to fueled in politics and emotion? Uh, I'd say 90% emotion. It's House 4139. This bill is is going to affect you. No matter yeah. what you're doing with firearms, um, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect people who want to carry for self-defense, who mm-hmm. want to keep a gun in their home for self-defense. Mm-hmm. If you hunt, if you shoot trap, if you shoot competition, and there's nothing in it that would address any criminal issues, which is what it was supposedly proposed at the outset to do, to make the Commonwealth safer. But in our opinion, it does nothing to do that. Hi, everybody. This is Matt from Hunt Fish, New England. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We hope that you listen to this in its entirety. We hope that you do your best to inform yourself, to look at the bill yourself. But more importantly, we hope that Mike Harris from the Gun Owners Action League, who is our guest today, breaks it down for you so you better understand this bill. You may have seen signs for this, and you still might see signs for this if you're driving through Massachusetts about stopping HD 4420. Well, this is the most recent version of that bill. So thank you again for listening, and we hope that you share this with others and you find this informative on how our hunting rights and our two-way rights are being infringed on here in Massachusetts. Everyone, thank you for tuning in to the Hunt Fish New England podcast. Um, if there's anything we've learned since we started this podcast, it's that a lot of what we do in the outdoors, especially here in New England, is determined by legislation. And right now in Massachusetts, we have a bill, um, and Mike will talk more about that bill exactly, that is affecting us as gun owners and also outdoorsmen here in Massachusetts. So I'd like to introduce and thank uh, Mike Harris. He's the Director of Public Policy here at the Gun Owners Action League of Massachusetts. Mike, thanks for coming on tonight. No, of course. Thanks for having me, Matt. I appreciate it. It's uh, It was cool that you called me. It was awesome. Thank yeah. you for making the time. And um, Of course. We just like went on a rant for like five minutes um, covering some good. stuff. So um, let's just jump right into it. Mike, what is the current bill and what should we know about the bill? Uh, so right now the, the bill that was passed by the House uh, 120 to 38 is uh, it's House 4139. That's the final bill number. It ended up with, uh, let's see, first it was 4420, then mm-hmm. it was 4607, and then it was uh, 4939, but you don't have to worry about that one, because that was just a, that was a legislative dirty trick they pulled, and then it was uh, 4135 when it came to the floor for a vote, and then halfway through deliberations, it became 4135.2, because the... Uh, they had to change it from a um, a budget bill to a straight legislative piece. And then the final amended version that they passed on the House ended up being House 4139, uh, an act modernizing firearm laws, which is a creative title, yeah, <laughs> in, like in we were, my opinion. And like we were saying, it's almost like the opposite of modernizing firearms. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it does nothing to address the... Um, issue it was uh, proposed to address right you know back in june uh when uh speaker mariano tasked uh chairman day who's the chair of the house judiciary committee to do this top-down review of the state's gun laws um we kind of looked at it as an opportunity to say like okay cool this is this is this seems like a guy we can work with it Mm -hmm. seems like something we can take an opportunity to, to to get our to get a seat at the table because they called us directly i i had known mike before um i was kind of happy that he was the guy who was doing it and then throughout the entire process we were you know we were kind of given a seat at the table we worked with them to kind of just get through every all of our um for lack of a better way to put it uh priorities mm-hmm. and stuff that we wanted to see and not see and then at the end of the day, we got, at the end of the process, we got this giant 140 plus page bill of, that was basically just a gun control wish list. Right. It looked like it was written by Giffords or like every town. So um, there's nothing in it that uh, addresses mental health issues except for a huge and draconian expansion of the red flag law. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing in it that would address any criminal issues which is what it was supposedly proposed at the outset to do to make the commonwealth safer 
but on our opinion it does nothing to do that and doesn't think doesn't the commonwealth have like the lowest rate of gun violence in the nation isn't that the current stat <sighs> it's my my colleague uh, our executive director is a lot is a lot better at addressing this point mm -hmm. um but since 1998 and since the gun control provisions of 98 like the assault weapons ban and all the licensing schemes that have been kind of uh three card monty around since then uh violent crime is up 111 percent in massachusetts uh a suicide rate by gun has gone down but it's you know it's it's less than hangings and poisonings combined mm -hmm. um hangings over hangings prop, uh, purposeful overdoses and poisoning combined like so there and we don't have an accident issue in massachusetts uh because of the things that we do to make sure that once you decide to become a gun owner in massachusetts part of being a responsible gun owner culturally in this state is to make sure you go out and train and make sure you know how to use your firearms responsibly and mm -hmm. you know what you're doing with it how to use them you know the four the four rules of safety all that yep, stuff yep. so um you know that's the party line got it that we're you know one of the safest states in the union but we're the most violent state in new england <laughs> oh okay yeah so you know those uh these these gun control measures as they're standing right now are not really working we have a whole report about it i can give you a copy if you want to put it up but sure. it's you know it's it's for it's for another day <laughs> sure um so let's let's break it down a little bit so mm -hmm. this bill it's gonna affect should it go through and everything it's gonna affect people's just general gun ownership yep and their ability to carry it's gonna affect outdoorsmen and including like the age at which people can hunt i'm pretty sure yep. there's a provision there and also um implement probably implementation um but then other things as well yeah um, i mean it, so let's break it down what how how does this bill going to affect gun ownership in massachusetts so that is a loaded question that has a lot to it um so one of the biggest things is um the training requirements are going to go through the roof it's going to be crazy let me i have to pull this up because i i need to make sure i'm getting this all because it's just there's so much to this there's going to be in order to get your gun license and to, everybody i mean you've gone through basic pistol yep. safety courses mm -hmm. or and you've gone through hunter ed i'm sure yes sir um so in order to get your basic pistol course requirements out of the way mm -hmm. you would need to go through the safe use handling and storage of firearms fine methods of securing and child proofing firearms the applicable laws relating to the possession transportation and storage of firearms all this stuff sounds great knowledge of operation potential dangers and basic competency in the owner in the use ownership and yeah use and ownership of firearms injury prevention and harm reduction education and here's where it gets really silly active shooter and emergency response training <laughs> applicable laws relating to the use of force so the force continuum de-escalation and disengagement tactics and live fire training wait that's just to just to get an ltc just to get your ltc yeah oh yeah so it 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 vastly expands the topics of of the curriculum that would have to be covered in order to just get your basic pistol permit so just more red tape in, in order to just get a yeah. firearm yep and uh and the 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 big one there is live fire training so as most people know we don't have public ranges in massachusetts we're we're kind of a we're kind of a unique state in where the majority like i would say like 90 plus percent of ranges in massachusetts are private clubs yep and most of them are at capacity and have certain restrictions on um you know just basic rules on when training is allowed what type of training is allowed and that's that's perfectly fine that's on them it's private property that's how it works um so in order to have live fire training we would need to figure out where that can take place if we're going to have everybody who wants to get a basic pistol permit um go out and do live fire training where we're going to do it right yeah, because not every Who, school has a range. Yeah, who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Where are you going to go? Right. Like we don't we 
we uh, we have a we used to do the the pistol the basic pistol course here, but we don't offer it as much anymore because we like to branch out and we have a lot of trainers in our network that do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and but we don't have a we don't have a range here, right? We can't do that. We have a big classroom across the hallway, but we don't have a range here. We can't do live fire training mm-hmm. and you know pistol handling with live ammunition in this building. Is we have we have neighbors upstairs. <laughs> it's impossible. So. Yeah. You know, it, it's just another barrier to entry, you know, both both time-wise, financially, and, you know, just practically. It's it's going to be just all the more difficult to get a license in Massachusetts. So that's for people who want to mm-hmm. get into firearms. What about, if this bill passes, how is it going to affect people who are current gun owners and responsible gun owners? Uh, so, again, I mean, that's that's another long answer. Um, there's a there's a, a whole host of things. So the um, one of the things that we're we're hoping we can keep from this bill um, is we're we're going to try to the state is actually currently working on this. From what we've been told, is they're going to be working on kind of reversing the process. You know how right now you go and you apply, you, you hand in your application to your local police chief. Yep. They go through it and they send it up to the state, and then you get your license if you get approved. Yep. What we'd like to see, and one of the things that we're hoping, one of the only things in this bill that we were like, okay, that sounds all right, was it kind of reverses the process where you would apply at the state level first. Mm. And then they would kick it down to the locals to, you know, give you their suitability rating and sure. then send it back up and you'd, you'd get your renewal that way. Um, you know, we're, you're still going to have to go through your you know, the interview and you get your photo. And I might not have to get your photo taken. We're working on trying to make them migrate that stuff from the RMV. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you would still need to go get your um, your fingerprints and all that yep. nonsense. Um, when I did that, it was a pretty good experience, I thought. Um, yeah. But uh, I could see how it would be easier doing it from the state to the local. Exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, it's it's never a bad thing to, to go and talk to your local police department. Right. You know. Yep. It is what it is. <laughs> um, but you know on top of that there's also going to be some some practical restrictions i mean this hugely oh actually no let's get into this so this vastly expands the assault weapons ban uh, on top of creating a new list or expanding the list of named banned firearms like it goes to like the mini 14 at this point the tavor um the thompson you wouldn't be able to get a tommy gun it's it's like it's disgraceful, um, but on top of that, it makes it it makes the case, or I guess it would enforce a single feature assault weapons test. So your your turkey gun that has a pistol grip and is a semi auto that holds five rounds would be an assault weapon. So they're reclassifying what an assault weapon is. They're completely reclassifying and hugely expanding the list, like vastly expanding the list of like i said specified listed enumerated firearms that are banned outright and then creating a single feature test which basically acts as a semi-automatic firearm ban right yeah all i mean long guns you'd still be able to get pistols but you know for guys who want to shoot trap or you know go to go duck hunting right that's that's your turkey gun and that's your 20 gauge with a pistol grip man yeah and I, I got to assume some guys who were just hunting the shotgun season, which just wrapped up or shooting yeah. a semi-auto shotgun. Yeah. I mean, you would have your limiter in there and all that stuff, but that's, that's the deal. That's, well, that's the most commonly used fi- waterfall gun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's what they're for. I think that's why they were invented for God's sake. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. All right. So but, in addition to that, what about, um, there's, I remember there was some comment about serialization and things of that that nature yeah so it it, the the final version of the bill kind of pared down the serialization aspect you'd still need to get like your barrel serialized and your upper and your lower receiver if you're gonna have that um did the final version did away with the uh serialization of magazines which was a wild thing to include in there yeah when i first heard that i was just like that's yeah like it you like they were setting themselves up for failure on yeah. that because you don't you never had to report like you never you don't even have to show your LTC to buy a magazine right in this state that's crazy so they don't know what people had for the first of all so like they're setting themselves up there and second of all it's just 
what a what a crazy thing to do i told some <laughs> some of my very liberal friends uh-huh. about that and even they were like wait really yeah it's yeah. nuts yeah but they're talking about no exceptions i mean since 1968 um any firearm has had to have a serial number like federally it's been mandated mm-hmm. um you know currently you can you can build your own gun and give it a serial number later on if you want to sell it but right now i we have a disagreement in the office uh, we, we kind of discuss it uh if you build your own if you build your own gun in massachusetts you're supposed to report that you completed it and give it like a unique serial number within seven days of completing it like if you get a like an 80 percent so a re- i should backtrack a little bit a lower a, a frame or a lower receiver or a receiver is not considered a firearm in massachusetts until it can fire a projectile that's the current law um so that's how your guy that's how guys get like clocks mm-hmm. and stuff in masters you buy a frame and you assemble it yourself okay and then you can report it um so this would do away with that this would make you know parts kits 80 percent, all that stuff it would require you to serialize things um but like i was saying before since 1968 the feds have mandated that any gun that's sold commercially that isn't, you know, an 80% or less uh, receiver mm-hmm. at the time of sale has to have a serial number on it. In Massachusetts, this bill would it would go even farther than that. It would say anything, any firearm in Massachusetts would have to have a serial number. So you, your collectors, you find yourself Lee Enfield mm-hmm. that was on the Maginot line. You're going to have to serialize that piece of history that you have on your wall it's it's wild so it's it's that kind of stuff where we're looking at this going like what are you guys thinking my gosh yeah it's it's nuts and they have yet to show us an example and we were we've been we've been talking with the police chiefs association um about all of this they somebody has yet to show us a circumstance where he's where a a crime was solved by tracking a serialized gun <laughs> <laughs> okay so what what would be the the advantage if any for a serialization of every firearm i don't know because <laughs> <laughs> once it's once it's stolen or once it's like sold or once somebody who who isn't supposed to have a gun acquires it it could change hands a hundred times before it it's used in a crime Mm -hmm. and then once it's used in a crime who's the last guy on record of owning it it's you (laughs) right they don't know who bought it in the meantime Mm -hmm. if it gets if somebody steals a gun out of your car or whatever i mean that's irresponsible on your part but you know but in between the the time when it was stolen and the crime was committed it wasn't in your possession and as long as you report that it's not on you so what does the serial number do I guess nothing. It does nothing. Yeah. It just tracks you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I've, from everything I've observed from work, from starting in this job a couple of years ago, um, all the fancy CSI stuff where they have a gun and they have a bullet and they, they fire a, a cartridge and then they pull the projectile out and line up the stre- That's I, from what I can gather from going through this process, that's complete fiction. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's no uh there's no projectile fingerprints where you can line up striations in a bullet i mean uh it was a good show though it's sure it's a great show and and i love science fiction just as much as the next guy <laughs> but you know it, it's it, it's crazy there's mm-hmm. uh, barrels especially uh pistol barrels which is what most gun crime is committed with are are like mass produced they're all of the same twist rate they're all you know whatever you're buying it's it's basically the same thing right you know you get a you get a, a p320 barrel from agency arms it's got the same it's got the same twist ratio that like the the sig barrel has like it's it's because from the same gun it's it's the same thing like it it's wild to me that you know it it's it's the suppressor example that i i, I always bring this up because it's you want to make sure that people who are making the rules have as much education as they can have before they try and make rules. Sure. And then you look at things like suppressor policy and you're like, have you ever shot or heard a gun 
that has a suppressor on it. Like I have, I have a YouTube video loaded up on my phone mm-hmm. of uh, it's a of an NIH like National Institute of Health doctor showing the decibels of like what a suppressor is and what it isn't, and you, you, know, you get the, the suppressor association. Um, and you, you you go and you talk. You have these meetings with politicians, and that was one of the things that I brought up during the the listening tour and all that stuff i was like can we get suppressors it's like if you're going to restrict all this other stuff can we have this conversation because there's information that you do not have Mm -hmm. because you don't have john wick and common walking through a train station shooting at each other in a crowded in a crowd and nobody noticing a nine millimeter with a suppressor on it sounds like a nine millimeter just (laughs) a little bit less yeah so i mean it's that kind of stuff You, you run into people who are just completely misinformed and don't know what they're talking about i mean we we had a meeting when i first started here with the uh the chair of uh, public safety and we were meeting with his staff and we were going through you know all the stuff that we were he got a new uh he got a new legal counsel and he wanted us to walk through things because that's that committee is where these bills start out on usually Mm -hmm. except for this last one where it went through judiciary for some reason yeah um and we were like, hey, this is the online portal where you, you know, you need to report your transactions and all this stuff. They're like, what do you mean? What is it? We're like, the online portal that you guys passed the law about a couple years ago that you, you designed? This is this is it. And they're like, oh, we didn't know that this existed. We didn't know you had to report. Th-. Like, what are you doing? There's <laughs> yeah, this all is this, your portal. Yeah, this is your stuff. This, these are the laws that you guys passed. This is the implementation of them, you know, 10 years later. And, 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 you know, we tell them, like, oh, yeah, there's the FID and the LTC. They're like, what's that? I so, see a lot of that. What do you mean? That. Yeah, a lot of people uh, don't know the yeah. difference. Yeah. It's just crazy. It, but but this is, I, I mean, you talk to a, an average person not knowing that. That's fine. Right. But we have the, the, the chair of public safety who is responsible for making sure that, that this type of legislation is is drafted accurately and gets to the floor without errors and is and is just you know proper not knowing any of this stuff and you, you're just like oh this guy's been a state rep for like 20 years at this point you've been in this position for the last three sessions what's going on like why why haven't you this is your this is your job so you know over at, at goal we try to that's one of our you know main objectives especially for me um you know i'm I'm one of the registered lobbyists here it's my job to go and have these conversations and make sure that these guys have accurate information because i I always tell them like i am never going to lie to you i promise Mm -hmm. if i'm if you ask me for information and it's detrimental to our cause and you disagree with us and it's going to hurt us i'm still going to give it to you because i would rather you have the proper information and know what the hell you're talking about before you try and pass laws that are going to restrict law abiding citizens from exercising a constitutional right. Right. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I don't know. It, it's just, they've guns have just become so political. That was going to be another reason. question. Yeah. Like how much of this, I'll just ask it now. Anyways, yeah. how much of this bill is based on facts and risk? And oh, responsive boy. to facts compared to fueled in politics and emotion. Uh, I'd say ninety percent emotion. I mean, like I said, this bill is it's a it's like it reads like a gun control wish list. Mm-hmm. It's all of the provisions that you can think of that have been pushed by like every town and uh, Giffords and all those guys for the last ten years. Like it, it's everything you can yeah. possibly think of. I mean, from from a sensitive places re- expansion restriction to, you know, a huge, a vastly uh, expanded assault weapons ban mm-hmm. to, um, you know, live fire mandated training to, uh, you know, increased sensitive, pl- or I already said the sensitive places thing, but, you know, it it's everything you can think of is just crammed into this bill. Mm-hmm. Is it going to affect um, people carrying who have um, LTCs and concealed carry permits? Yeah, I mean it's going to expand the list of sensitive places. That's that's kind of the biggest thing for me. 
Um, Can you define sensitive space, uh, spaces for people who don't know? Oh, man. So it's it gun-free zones, basically. Gotcha. Um, so right now, <clears throat> I think Bruin said that uh, certain public buildings, courthouses, schools, and uh, polling places, I think that was the whole... I, if I missed one, I apologize, but I think that's the, the list from Bruin, um, are traditionally acceptable limited spaces and then you know they allowed people to make the case to expand that list um but this bill goes way beyond that um and kind of just says like you know anywhere that's private property unless you're told otherwise is a sensitive place any public building any public property like you know state um state parks except for hunting purposes Mm -hmm. uh stuff like that so i mean if you're you know if you want to carry a 10 millimeter on your hip you know going for a hike just in case you run into uh you know mr black bear you can't do that or if you want to or what about what about somebody trying to protect themselves from somebody else on the train (laughs) yeah yeah the mbta would is uh is was mentioned um I don't remember the ex- the specific list of everything from the bill because it's expansive, mm-hmm. um, but it's you know it's a big one. Um, it just it's basically gun free zones. Wow, which kind of just negates the purpose of um, it. Just further infantilizes people. I think um, you know you already have to prove that you're a suitable person and that you can get a license in this state to carry mm-hmm. and even to possess a firearm we don't even have a we don't even have a, we don't even have purchase permits here it's it's like all or nothing um you know a lot of other states like rhode island you can get like a a card to purchase and possess and not carry we don't even have that here you know the fid is is a different kind of permit because you can't purchase pistols with it you can't purchase handguns just long guns but and this would kind of change it to a long gun permit mm-hmm. instead of an fid you would just rename it um but um this would make it so that you couldn't carry even concealed like anywhere. <laughs> so like what if I was carrying, right? Mm-hmm. And I went to um I went to a restaurant, mm-hmm. right? And um I was carrying, I was going to a holiday party. Yep. And I was just carrying and it's private property. And does that what if that person I didn't know well, I would have to get permission from the restaurant to so, carry? Is yeah, that, so so right, right now, right now if they say no guns allowed and you carry in there, it's just simple trespass. So they would have to po- post. Yep. They would have to post like guns welcome. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So it would be a proactive kind of thing. They pared it down a little bit in this final version. It's not as like kind of outlandish as that, mm-hmm. but um, it kind of expands it to like people's homes and stuff like that. And it says like, you know, basic places like a restaurant, you'd be fine. Um you know, the spirit of it is just really weird to me because we already make people pass all these safety tests and suitability tests and yeah. make sure that you can get a license. And then we say, oh, well, even if you have a license, you can't use it to do anything. So in, in the, we'll just use the holiday season as mm-hmm. an example. I go to somebody's, let's say this bill has been passed and whatever. Yeah. I go to somebody's house. Yep. I they have can, to get written permission from them to bring they, a gun to their house? Uh, written, I, I, it doesn't really specify written, Yeah, but uh, yeah, they can charge you with a crime. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it opens you up to. Wow. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not a good bill. They're, no. Everything, I'm telling you, you bring up a topic related to firearms, it's probably in here. <laughs> wow. So, I, as you said, it's a very expansive. Um, Huge. Anything, any other major things that would, that would affect the common gun owner, um, um, before we get into like shooting sports and hunting? Yeah. So I, the big thing is the training mandates for me. Um, it's, it makes it so mandating training to begin with, I think is, is kind of weird. It's a, it's a really weird roadblock to you know, exercising a constitutionally protected right Mm -hmm. um, and then expanding it to live fire training, which could potentially be a financial roadblock is, is a little weird too. I mean, you're it's, it already costs you a hundred bucks to get a license to to take the class then a hundred to take to get your license. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, however much the gun costs. And then by the end of that, you've 
uh, that's a fun fact for you. So if, <laughs> if you if you go through the entire licensing process yeah. and you go and you purchase one firearm, you've had four background checks at four different three different levels of government. What are they? So you you when you first apply, you get your state level background check, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, you get your local level background check, your suitability test from the from the police department. Okay. Then it goes up to the state, where they do an FBI background check with your fingerprints and a state level background check. So those are the three that you go through when you get your license. Yeah. And then if you purchase one gun, you get a NICS background check. So if you go through the process and you purchase one firearm from an FFL, you go through four different background checks. We're the most vetted people in the entire Commonwealth. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's wild. That's just hard to like, <laughs> hard to grasp. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then we're the ones who can't be trusted. We're responsible. You know, the, the, the law abiding, I hate using that phrase mm-hmm. because it applies that we, it implies that all uh, laws are, uh, moral <laughs> and proper to be followed okay uh so i don't like to use that i like to say responsible gun owners mike mike uh went to law school so he's uh, he he can speak about this piece. I'm, a, I'm also a rabid libertarian so <laughs> 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 they're just infantilizing people that have already gone through this like vigorous process um and saying like oh even though you've gone through this we're going to make sure that you can't carry this here because we're scared we're afraid you know we've had conversations with with legislators who are like if I'm sitting on a train and I see a guy who's got a concealed gun on him and he like reaches over and I can see it, I'm afraid. Like, what are you afraid of? What's he doing to you? Mm-hmm. Is he just sitting there reading a book, like minding his own business, but you're afraid that the gun is in the same train cars? Like what's, what's the deal? So I don't know. It, it's, it's a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a weird legal thing. <laughs> right. And it's, unless we can kind of get, proper information out there it's just going to get worse and it's you know we're, we're hopeful that the senate is going to take a little more of a um measured approach mm-hmm. when they look at the issue or while they're looking at the issue uh you know we've already been told that they the house language is not on the table because it's too expansive the way that they went about doing it that's a whole nother thing if you want to get into that i that, would love to get on that into that so <laughs> let's the, let's do one thing before yeah, we get into that yeah um other than the background checks, any any like glaring things you think people should know um, in terms of just general gun ownership um, or carrying? Just you know, we're, we we always tell people just be mindful of what you're doing. Um, it's this bill is is going to affect you no matter what part of the sport. Eh, sport is a weird way to put it but like no matter what you're doing with firearms um it's going to affect you it's going to affect people who want to carry for self-defense who Mm want to keep a gun in their home for Mm self-defense if you hunt if you shoot trap if you shoot competition oh that's another one anyone under 15 can't handle a semi-auto firearm i want to tackle that whole chunk um like and it's in mm-hmm. probably the latter half absolutely of this. yeah but yeah that's that's something that's huge. killing me especially as a father who's gonna bring a kid up and me that too stuff so you, um, you bet your ass my kids are gonna learn how to shoot and it's have a, gotten it's no a life gun skill safety. it's a life skill i find it's it also, to be a life skill it's also a, a basic bedrock tradition of this country like it's part of it, it is it might be the most unique thing about the united states is that there is a a mechanism built into the founding document that allows people or not allows i'm sorry that's the wrong word to use that restricts the government from restricting people to have the means to overthrow them if they get too uppity (laughs) (laughs) most people don't understand that yeah that's the language that's that's what it's there for those guys had just fought a war using civilian owned firearms they started it and ended it with civilian owned firearms and i mean all the way from privateers on down you could you could own a warship back then with multiple cannons on it <laughs> and and an armory in the in the in the hull so it's it, it, all these people who make the argument that it was never a, a, an individual right and it's a, the right of the state you're completely wrong <laughs> mm, wow. you know in in law school they always one of the things they always tell you to look at is is the legislative process that led to or legislative intent and process that led to the passage of a statute Mm -hmm. 
read the Declaration of Independence and look at all of the events leading up to the drafting of the Constitution after the Articles of Confederation were, were torn up. It, the legislative intent was to put roadblocks in front of the government from restricting you, and this is one of those roadblocks. <laughs> So I don't know. It's just wild to me that this is that this is even a, a conversation this day and age. Mm-hmm. So you said you want to get into the bill and how oh, it came to be. The way this passed yeah. is yeah, wild. Sorry. Yeah, the bill and how it passed. The way they got this to the floor is egregious. It's it's one of I've been doing this for oh my God, not so counting my time at goal. I've probably been doing legislative work for Jesus two thousand and eight. How long is that? 15 years 15 years oh my god that's terrifying <laughs> i've been doing this for 15 years um in one one capacity or another either working for you know members of the house or members of the senate and then the governor and now doing this um well, that's a long time um i've never seen this done with something this big before and so here's what they did this is wild so um back in june uh the speaker of the house tasked representative day to do a top-down review of the state's gun laws all of them all all sections i i don't even remember how many there are i just know that ron glidden is the uh, he's retired he's a retired police chief um and he is the he's the he's the the only name in town when it comes to training law enforcement in the gun laws of the commonwealth and the textbook that he wrote for that class is 456 pages of just massachusetts gun law and the last 10 pages are federal law but the first 446 are just massachusetts so that that tells you something Noted. But yeah so he tasked mike day to do this top-down review so he's like okay he takes the uh he calls us and says hey we're doing this how should we do it? We said, well, we have a list of stuff that we want and stuff that we want to get rid of. We know we're not going to get everything, but we'll give you everything we got. So we started working on that. Uh, they decided to do a an 11-stop listening tour, they called it, through the Commonwealth there, where they would address... They would have a panel in like different parts of the state. They would have a panel in each meeting to discuss things that was made up of like various experts on different topics from law enforcement to gun control advocates to we had john green from our office our trainer was on on a panel um a board member of ours was on a panel we had <clears throat> toby leary from cape gunworks was on a panel for us um you know we we had a seat at the table and we were part of the discussion uh so we go through that whole listening tour we're kind of like okay this was this was kind of nice like it was you know it seemed like they were listening we had we had a very good showing of 2a advocates at every stop Mm -hmm. um you know i i went to nine of them out of out of 11 and the nine that i went to the representation in the audience was pretty evenly split it was an open forum everyone could talk and the questions were pretty even i think we we had a, a very good showing of of people who are pro second amendment um and so we went through this whole thing and i get a call from rep day on uh the morning of october i believe it was no it was september 8th i think was the date he said hey this thing's dropping in a or in a couple minutes i was like okay holy hell so i pull it up there's hd 4420 i think everybody's probably seen the You've signs, seen the signs. <laughs> yep um and we start reading this thing and we're like oh my god there's nothing in here that we discussed this is everything that the gun controllers could possibly could possibly want Mm -hmm. literally everything in here is 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 against us it just restricts law-abiding citizens so we said holy hell we have to stop this so we started our campaign to to contact your reps and we put the kibosh on it for almost a cup for almost two months and then they come out with this new version of the bill and it's just as bad hd 4607 we said okay we're gonna keep going so then they dropped that on a thursday and they're right before holiday weekend 
and or right before Columbus Day. I'm sorry. And then they say, okay, the Tuesday we come back, that's the hearing. It's like, oh, okay. So we go to this hearing, and it turns out it is a ways and means. It's a joint ways and means and judiciary hearing. So for anybody who doesn't know the legislature, if you have a bill, if a bill comes from House Ways and Means, it means there's going to be money spent in it. It's a budget bill. So we get this notification that they're hearing this bill on at this hearing. So like, okay, I guess we're going to have to go testify. So we got all our stuff together mm-hmm. to go and do that. Sorry about that. It's all good. To go, t- to go and, and testify at this hearing. And we get there and they say, okay, this is the bill. This is the language. This is the new number. So we're like, okay, what are you talking about? So it, they stuffed it. What they did was Governor Healy had filed a supplemental budget, which is just a a reshuffling of funds like halfway through the budget process mm-hmm. where um you know they can like reallocate things where they had, they need more money or they need less money in different departments and so what they did was they took the language from 4607 the gun control bill s- took a time machine basically <laughs> stuck it into uh i think it was 4939 which is the the supplemental budget bill they stuck it in there just as a didn't didn't amend it didn't do anything just stuck it in there as and pretended as if it is always it had always been part of this bill extracted it after the hearing and pushed it to the floor so they took they took a constitutional right like 150 pages worth of restrictions on a constitutional right played a bs legislative dirty trick with it and just stuck it on the floor for a house vote it's wild. That's that's the most basic explanation I can give you, and I don't even know if that really makes sense. It, it, <laughs> it makes sense because I was looking at the different versions of the bill yeah. and everything, and I'm seeing the vote counts and things. It's nuts. Yeah, they 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 basically took a time machine. It's they they basically bypassed half of the house's legislative process. So nor ordinarily, when you file a bill, especially a late file. It has to go to House Rules, then it will get assigned to a committee, then it will get a hearing if they want to give it one. I can't believe they gave it one, depending, you know, looking at the rest of the process. Um, and then it would have to go to first reading where the, oh, I'm sorry, it goes to, it gets read first by the clerk. So that's the first reading. And then it would go to second reading, it would get, which means it would get read on the floor. They would pass it on to the next process. Then it would have to go to the committee on third reading where it's it gets its final like revisions and the lawyers look at it and they make sure it's like you know properly cited Mm -hmm. and then it would go to a floor vote this basically bypassed the rules committee the um first reading from the clerk and then second reading it basically bypassed all of that so by taking a docket number and putting it in a hearing with ways and means and sticking it in a bill that already had a bill number and had already gone through first and second reading, they could just pull it out and just throw it right on the floor for third reading and, and, uh, engrossment. (laughs) It's crazy. I mean, and we, we've had conversations with, with a couple senators since, and, and we, I bring it up. I'm like, listen, I don't care if you're against us or for us in this country. The Second Amendment is a constitutional right. Mm-hmm. Firearms ownerships, firearms ownership, and the potential restriction of that deserves a lot more consideration than a a, a a sneaky legislative dirty trick that might be, you know, perfectly legal under the rules that you guys set up, but you know, just undermines the credibility of the entire institution. And in your experience, you'd never seen that. I've never seen them do this with, with something this big. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've done it with stuff before, but like, it's, it's like funding things. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, somebody needs a bridge in their district or something but, like that. But never with a constitutional, never right. with a, never with something this, this controversial and yeah. this big, and, you know, and, and when one of your rules is that you can suspend the rules, do you really have any rules? Yeah. And I, I don't remember what my final count was, but I went through the, I, I kind of mapped out the entire process start to finish. And I think they suspended the rules like 
six times to get it to the floor for a, a vote <laughs> before the end of it. it it's just crazy. It, it's I'm a total moron when it comes to this stuff, no, but just it, hearing it, it sounds dirty. It's dirty it, play, it sounds like. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's it's perfectly fine for them to... The fact that they did it and they could do it and it wasn't, like, stopped. So so the, the, when you look at the, the setup or the, the construction of, of the, the state government parallels the, the federal government. You know, you have the, the executive, it's the governor, legislative branch and the judiciary the three different branches have you know their own powers divvied up to them the separation of powers Mm -hmm. and within that is the ability to set the rules by which they operate and nobody else has anything has any say over that none of the other three branches have a say over how that works so the house and senate set their own rules on how they are going to operate Mm -hmm. so you know just the basic legislative process is mapped out what the dress code is, which rooms are allowed to, to be used for what, you know, how many votes does it take to get a roll call, that kind of stuff, like mm-hmm. like basic day to day things. Yeah. But it also includes the rules of order, like the legislative process. And one of the rules is you can suspend the rules if you have enough people voting for it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it basically just gives them free reign to do whatever they want and nice. they're accountable to nobody. Um, and you know, we're goal, but for the most part is a nonpartisan organization, you know, traditionally one party is more friendly to our cause than, than the other. Right. And that's okay. But, um, you know, our bread and butter is, is pro gun Democrats. That's those, that's where we have to live. Um, because those are the people that are going to make the difference. So when we have, you know, friends that are on the other side of the aisle from, the party that traditionally supports our cause uh we we have to work with those people and um we've talked to a few of them who have said they who voted for this bill that have in the past gotten a's from a ratings from us and gotten endorsements from us and we're like what what happened Mm -hmm. like well we got strong-armed we had no choice we had to vote for this so this is kind of it's like legacy shopping for the speaker and just kind of I don't know. It felt it felt very personal when they when they finally passed it. <laughs> yeah, sounds it. So, so I don't know. It it's when we talk to people and we 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 show them what happens. Everybody has the same reaction you do. They're like, "What?" Yeah, I'm kind of speechless. Yeah, it's. I mean, I don't care how you feel about this this issue. It it's a constitutionally protected right, mm-hmm. and in this country, it's considered a civil right. It deserves a lot more consideration than some dirty legislative trick. Yeah. And that's that's how the, unless they're just telling us what we want to hear, that's kind of what we're hearing from the Senate side as well. They're kind of like looking at the way the House did it and going, ugh. Mm-hmm. So, unless they're lying to us, which you know they're politicians, and not to offend anybody who you might they might not be, um, they're they're kind of feeling a uh, feeling a way about this. So, I don't know. That's that's kind of my. Uh, I'm trying to like collect my thoughts as I'm going through this because I keep thinking of new things that are like part of this that are driving this is, me crazy. I'm so I'm so <laughs> thankful that you're bringing this up because no, no, no worries. Even people who are buying the signs and, and mm-hmm. are opposed to the bill, they don't know this, and this is so important for people to know. Oh, that's why we that's why we're here. I mean, that's yeah. that's I get paid to do this, and it's it's awesome. But like, that's who the hell who. who 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 what person that has a full-time job that you know works for a living has kids has like day-to-day stuff to do has time to read a bill like this i couldn't even really understand most of the language it's it's, It's it's, crazy without a law degree it's hard to decipher what it actually means (sighs) well so that's that's another thing about just basic legislative drafting um when you look at a bill and it's not like interpreted for you and you just see the actual language of the bill, it's hard to understand what you're looking at unless you go back, unless you have a copy of the law that they're referring to. Right, right. So a lot of times they'll be like, oh, so like section 131F of chapter 140 is amended by striking out the word they in line 54 of section whatever the hell and replaced with them. 
like that kind of stuff. So yep. in order to like see what they're talking about, like changing one word can change the entire like meaning of a section of law. So you'll be like, okay, I have to find section 131F of chapter 140 and go down and look at it. They're like, all right, so and in line, whatever the hell, it says this. So if we change this word, it's going to mean that. Yeah. It's a it's it's a puzzle. Like you, you have to, you're doing a jigsaw puzzle for every single section of the of law or mm-hmm. of legislation that you're they're trying to amend. So and the other side of that coin that nobody talks about is the version of the law that they're referring to is that one right behind you. So there's this big giant there's a there's a giant bookcase over here. Yep, yep. Those the 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 free version of the law that you can find on malegislature.gov yep. is not citable. It doesn't have line numbers. It's not it's a it's kind of a fluid version of the law. It's the basics. Mm. That is what they're referring to. That's, the a, that's like a four thousand dollar set of books that you would have to go and find, or get yourself a LexisNexis subscription, or go to a library and pull out. You can't just go online and pull up the law mm-hmm. and do it that way. I mean, if you're if you got time to like search through and like really dive into it without line numbers, sure, eat your heart out. <laughs> but like, in order to actually understand what they're doing you have to go through the actual book and see like line 45 line 4792 like you have to see it to understand what it is so it's it's not deceptive it's the way that they operate yeah and it makes sense for legislators and i guess i don't really know another way for them to do it Mm -hmm. but you know it for the the lay person and the person who doesn't or who the person is just living their life and wants to you know exercise their second amendment and not have to worry about this all the time when do you have time to do that right it's crazy i know that was a long explanation to, to get there but you know this stuff drives me nuts no it's it makes complete sense and that these these things are so complicated that i think mm-hmm. they need you know that in depth of, a, of yeah. an explanation let's branch into shooting sports sure and um we had both mentioned like we fully anticipate getting our kids engaged in this. Absolutely. How is this bill going to affect kids getting engaged in shooting sports? Oh my God. So, um, as it stands right now, this law would make it so that actually here we have a whole section. Of, actually, if, if I don't, I don't I, I'm going to take a opportunity to, to plug something right here. So if you go to gold.org, um, and you just look at the homepage. The first thing up there is the uh, is our homepage on H forty one thirty nine, and we have a, a complete breakdown. We have a, a full um, summary breakdown, and then we have like a short, like you know, talking points breakdown, and then we have um, certain sections that we thought were a little more important. We we did like kind of a deep dive in. Like there's the training one, uh, the red flag laws. Oh, we haven't even talked about those yet. I don't even know if we have time to get into that stuff, but that that's that's a gross expansion. Um, and then we have a whole section on on junior shooters um, and hunters. So um, so it would repeal kind of critical protections for junior shooters and people who, and like kids who want to learn how to hunt mm-hmm. with their dad. Right. Like so, if you go into the woods and you want to, you know how it works now. If you're it, your kid can fire your gun on your license. So you can you can only bring as many firearms as you have a license to bring out there because you can't have a sidearm mm-hmm. on you, which right. is another yeah, whole I never, weird. Yeah. I always thought that was strange, especially like if you're because an archery hunter and you can't have a like a, like a you personal can't have your, carry. You can't even have your personal carry on yeah. you. Like I always the, thought that was strange. Yeah, the gun that you carry like day to day. Uh, you, you can't even have that with like, what you. If you what if wild. you're out there and you come across like a poacher and then you, you know. Yeah. Or if, <laughs> like what if you're out there and you come across somebody who wants to hurt you? Right. Like, uh, are you going to hit him with bird shot? I mean, <laughs> come on, man. But, or I, I don't know. The, the one I always think of is like black bears. Like, uh, I don't know about you. I know they're, I know they're like afraid of people, but like. There's a chance you get in front of a sow with cubs. Yeah. 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 And I mean, having a having a ten millimeter or like a you know forty four magnum would be pretty useful at that point. Sure. I mean, you're not you, if you hit a <laughs> you hit a hit a bear with a an arrow or you know a fifty cal lead ball might be good, but you know who the hell knows if you're gonna hit it with a 
with a muzzle loader yeah, yeah. Or, or bird shot you, you're in trouble true so i mean i don't know that stuff always drove me nuts but anyways going back <laughs> so if you want to bring your kid out with you like waterfowl hunting you better have a pump action shotgun because <laughs> if you have a semi-auto they're not going to get to use it you know your brand new 1301 that you just put your uh that you just like kind of shined up and got ready for uh for the season nope they can't shoot trap with semi-autos they can't go out on the range and with supervision shoot semi-autos and for a lot of kids like that's a that's a potential route to the olympics is that just uh, long guns no it's pistols too oh yeah the kids can't have handguns at all on this that's not even getting into it yeah all right keep going so get into um, it so it bans the possession of a pistol or revolver for any purpose for anyone under 21 you wouldn't be able to get a pistol for any purpose under 21 yeah you can go to war and you know carry a a beretta overseas but not here yeah i missed that part yep uh and anyone under 21 cannot purchase or possess a large capacity firearm or any semi-automatic rifle or shotgun yeah possess or purchase unless at an incorporated club or licensed shooting range under the direct supervision of a license to carry holder but no junior hunting with semi-automatics okay yep wild um so you would be able to get um like your so what amounts to the fid at 15 Mm -hmm. um and you'd be able to apply at 14 uh which is you know whatever it's like a a little bone they threw in there but um you'd still have to go through all the training courses you'd still have to go through live fire which i don't know how they do that because you can't possess a handgun (laughs) (laughs) okay yeah so it's it's wacky uh it doesn't it's not clear either if they're if hunter ed counts it's not they for we FID for, for a kid? For a kid. We don't we don't know if it counts. We have no idea. <laughs> it's crazy. It's a sound bill. Yep. Um what a, any all right, keep going. Keep going. No, so in uh any competition like it, it makes no provision exempting competition shooting, uh, you know, Olympic shooting, you know, sport shooting, nothing. So they would have to have if they're uh twenty if they're 20 years old and their birthday is tomorrow and they're doing Olympic shooting, their parent has to be with them supervising. But they wouldn't be able to shoot pistol. Like you wouldn't be able to do, you wouldn't be able to join a three gun competition or any pistol shooting at all. Not. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It, it's, there's, there's so much to this. Um, and I mean, the, and one of the wacky things that this does is it, it takes away uh, so uh, back in 2014, um, we had goals language was included to include was included in the that that bill that gigantic bill the 2014 bill that mm-hmm. that's another huge one, and that's a whole that's a topic for another day. <laughs> um, but we got language included that would make it so that anyone 14 and older could possess pepper spray with a with an FID. So if you mm-hmm. got a, if you had an FID, you'd be able to have it. Yep. This takes that away. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to get pepper spray until so, you're 18. <laughs> so a, uh, a teenage girl yep. who wants to go yeah. to Copley Square with her girlfriends or or to yeah. Newberry Street to shop can't have pepper spray. Nope, you can't have pepper spray at all until you're 18. In this, even if you have an FID, you could. I think it it makes it so that you would have to go through a process and get another chemical card. Which we eliminated back in 2014. It, but it also makes that kind of confusing as well. I notice it, some of this stuff we don't know what it does. It sounds like it, it sounds like they don't either. The it's very who poorly. Pass it's very it. poorly drafted. Uh, so you know, a non-resident under eight or un, at least a, not, a non-resident under 18 can't possess anything. So if you bring like a cousin to the range with you and he's not from here. Even if you, I mean, even if he doesn't, I mean, even if you're bringing like your kids who don't have FIDs or anything to the range to show your stuff and you have somebody from out of state, they can't come. <laughs> they, yeah. They can't even take a poke like, down range. No, nothing. You, they just have to sit there and watch. And I don't know how, I don't know how they, I don't know how they're going to police that. 
Like they're like, oh, are all these kids from Who Massachusetts? Not, yeah, exactly. It's, it's dude. There's there's just some stuff in this that we we read it and we're like, what is happening? Dang. Yeah. So non residents under eighteen can't possess a pistol or revolver for any purpose. Same as anyone under twenty one. Mm -hmm. uh, non residents under twenty one cannot possess a large capacity firearm or semi automatic shotgun or rifle for any purpose either. <laughs> when I so I was doing a little bit it's of reading. Crazy. When I read that, I was like, that can't be right. <laughs> Yeah, it's nuts. This bill, like, there's, uh, we do a lot of talk about unintended consequences, mm -hmm. but I think some of this stuff is completely intended consequences. <laughs> so I'm thinking from like a hunter's perspective, mm -hmm. if, um, let's say, well, I mean, I'll use my family for example. Sure. Like, let's say like my nephew gets into hunting and he comes up before he's 21 yeah. and I want to take him out pheasant hunting over on, over at the state park there or yep. at the wildlife management area. He can't come. Or he can't shoot. He can come with you, but he can't shoot. Even though he, in his state, he might have done all the yep. required things there. Yeah, there's no reciprocity Yikes. with Massachusetts, with any other state. Oh, and on uh, just another thing I thought of that affects people. Um, the temporary LTC, which is the out-of-state LTC, yep. is virtually eliminated by this bill. Um, I don't remember the exact language, but it's so... Uh, the the requirements to get one are so onerous, and the schedule to get it and renew it is like so stretched out and weird. So right is now, it, sorry, this is for adults or people under twenty one. Anyone who wants an LTC. Oh boy. Yeah, and I don't think you can get an, an out of state FID at all. That doesn't even exist. <laughs> but if you want an out of state LTC, it's basically for like security guards and like federal officers <laughs> yeah what about um i know in, in hd 4420 mm -hmm. there was a provision about the age in which somebody can start engaging in like education related to firearms or hunting at a certain age yeah this kind of keeps that language so what it's, is that exactly so anybody under 15 can't get educated on firearms laws and it's it's like it's the way it's written is it kind of like refers to schools to keep it out of schools and all that stuff and it's just it's just a way to stigmatize firearms ownership mm -hmm. further among young people that's so, the that's that's kind of the objective of this bill all the way around would that include like hunter's ed I th yes that our interpretation is yes it so, would and right yeah. now it's 12 right a yep kid, 12 kid can hunt at 12 in massachusetts but mm -hmm. this would restrict it potentially to 15 15 <laughs> okay <laughs> i mean it, it's there there's so much to it i mean yeah. the the 21 year old restriction is the weirdest one to me because when once you turn 18 you're supposed to be an adult now yeah but, you can pretty much do everything but drink or, or buy cigarettes now that, oh they yeah, change cigarettes that? and messages you have to be 21 too yeah it's bizarre <laughs> they, they just keep moving. i didn't even know that yeah they just keep shuffling stuff around it's mm -hmm. crazy but yeah i mean it's it's a bad pill but I mean, we we talk about the stuff that has unintended consequences, and we talk about that stuff all the time. But I I think, and it's our our position is some of this stuff is completely intended consequences. Mm -hmm. They they don't want this to be part of our culture. Anyways, it's it's, it's wild to me. So, um, our uh, our director of education, John Green, he's he is our gun law guru. You should have him on the show. He's an awesome, fascinating person to talk to he's he's been doing this for almost 30 years he can cite law for you backwards and forwards he's like an encyclopedia i feel like i might have seen him at huntstock you might have he's awesome dude he's he's the best he's great he's he is a a country everybody around the country knows who he is he's mm -hmm. a he's a renowned trainer he's a savant at his recallability for mass gun laws unbelievable. He can be like, oh yeah, they passed that in like April of 1997. <laughs> it was raining that day. They signed it with a red pen. Like uh -huh. that, it's wild. But um, I was gonna say he hunts in Concord, and sometimes he's out there and he's he'll come back and be like, you know, I'm sitting in this field, and I have my muzzle loader on me, and I'm thinking about it. I'm like, Jesus, like 200 some odd years ago. There were other guys in this field with muzzle loaders, <laughs> and you know the the whole thing started here, like the the entire revolution. The first shot was fired over 
the fact that they were going to come and destroy the battery in Lexington. And this state has just strayed so far from the ideas and the culture that created it that it's it's heartbreaking yeah but he's just sitting there he's like i'm sitting in this field where who knows what happened like you know however many years ago it's it's a field it's an open field in the middle of concord he's like sometimes you look down and you're like you'll find a musket ball he's like it's crazy the 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 farm that we hunt on he's like we're they find stuff all the time he's like it was it was probably a battlefield at some point yeah or or somebody doing hunting on their own because that's you know that's what they used back then and uh you know the history of of this place like i think 10 miles east of here is where the country started and we're having these discussions about you know whether military style firearms should be owned by civilians while there's two wars going on overseas where civilians have needed military style firearms which we have provided to them yeah and it's the most naive thing in the world to think that that can't happen here Mm -hmm. and we want to control it and make sure that nobody can do you know something that has been traditionally protected in this country it's it's just nuts yeah (sighs) wow um anything anything else related to hunting we should know about per this bill um so i don't think it changes anything um substantively to hunting like off the bat that i can think of sounds like it affects like recruitment though based off what you were just explaining big time yeah i mean the the big stuff is is the junior stuff um Mm -hmm. i think there's a oh you know some of the stuff that it doesn't address were a lot of the things that we brought up because we we've had we have perennial bills that we file almost every session you know carrying a sidearm during hunting we want that to be allowed yeah um expanding sunday or allowing for sunday hunting yeah silly yep um there's a weird provision in the law where during hunting season you can't walk through um land zoned for hunting with your dog or a firearm in between sunrise in between sunset and sunrise or sunrise and sunset i'm sorry i had the backwards Mm -hmm. you can't even walk you can't take your dog for a walk (laughs) or have a or have your concealed carry on you in the woods during that time and then there's the the weird one with the uh the the your gun has to be cased on an atv or off-road vehicle it's all that all that weird stuff um but we had we had brought like all of those issues up during the process and they were like oh yeah that is weird why can't you do that we should file that and we have all those bills filed and none of that stuff was included in this so it's not so much what this bill does to hunting you know past you know oh it also expands uh or yeah it expands the uh the buffer zone where you can discharge like so it shrinks the hunting zones around houses what does it do uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I think it shrinks it from like 500 yards to 1500 or something like that. 15? Don't, don't quote me. But it's, I, it, I, makes it, to, lo- it makes it larger. Yeah, it makes it large. The buffer zone larger. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and it increased penalty, increases penalty, penalties for um, for discharging in the direction of a home or across a public way, stuff like that. Like weird stuff mm-hmm. that you don't really think of that I think was intended more for like drive-bys. <laughs> and right. stuff but it would affect hunters Fif- uh, i mean more than i don't don't quote me sorry, on that but more than 500 is- yeah but don't don't quote me on the number i'd have to look it up i don't i i wish i had pulled that off the top of my head that was it's one okay. of the one you, things i didn't look at even using it as an example yeah like but but for the most part aside from those things it's more what this bill doesn't do that we've been asking for for like centuries mm-hmm than it than what it does aside from the the junior hunting stuff i mean that stuff's egregious on its own yeah um but yeah i mean it's a bad bill man it like all the way around it's just not good it's detrimental to everything we care about right (laughs) and it's going to touch every aspect of owning possessing using and you know wanting to use a firearm in the state of in the commonwealth of massachusetts well, uh, thanks yeah. to you and your team for what you're doing. No, and, no problem. I love it. Um, let's get into goal. We, yeah. I, let's, um, sure. Why don't you give to somebody who never even heard of to somebody who's never heard of goal. What is goal, and what do you what do you guys do? So we are the Gun Owners Action League. We are the state associate the state 
membership association that advocates for the Second Amendment. We are the largest, oldest one in Massachusetts. We've been around since November 27th, 1974. I know that because uh, the organization is exactly 10 years older than me, <laughs> gotcha. which is funny. So, um, you know, we're the oldest or the largest. We have more. We have uh, just over 20,000 members. Uh, we're, we need to expand that number, I think, because there's a lot of people that we talk to that don't know about what's going on. Is that goal mass or that's goal entirely? Goal ma- we're, we're solely in Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we are, we're, a, we're an only Massachusetts organization. Um, we have a staff of five people. Um, it's myself. I do the uh, public policy stuff. Um, I'm one of the registered lobbyists for the organization. And then we have uh, the executive director, Jim Wallace, who's been here for 25 years at this point. He is awesome. He's great. He's one of the most personable people I've ever met. He is He is probably responsible for, oh my gosh, uh Ninety percent of all the good things that have happened to gun owners since uh, nineteen ninety eight, since when he took over. Um, so you know anything that is good that happened, he's probably had a hand in it. He's uh, he's responsible for most for maintaining and establishing a lot of, I'd say probably ninety percent of the relationships that Goal has with legislators. Uh, I'm pretty good at it, but I'm a I'm a novice compared to him. He's he is uh, fantastic at his job. He's the other lobbyist for the organization. Um, we have uh, John Green, who is our director of education, and um, I'd say mostly just education and training. Uh, but he's also our um, current law expert. So if you call up here, and if you're a gold member, and you call up, and you have an you have a question about building a gun or you know licensing issues, he's the guy you want to talk to, and he is going to be able to either answer your question off the top of his head. Or send you to a lawyer that can answer it for you, which we have a nice little network of attorneys that we've built up uh, that you can find on our website, gold.org. We also have uh, Angie. Um, She is our director of membership, and she's also our chief. Actually, she's our chief of staff. That's her official title. Mm -hmm. But she uh, she handles all the membership stuff, kind of runs the office, keeps us in line. Yep. Um, And then our newest staffer is Carrie Ann O'Claire. She is our director of outreach and women's um, when it's something I forget what it is exactly, but it, mm-hmm. she's our director of outreach, um, and she is actually the uh, she's the state uh, director for the DC project, Women for Gun Rights. Um, she's also the state director for it used to be called the Well Armed Woman. I forget what they're called now. But they have a new they have a new name. Um, and she and another of our members, <clears throat> uh, Renee, uh, have a. a local access show that's kind of broadcast out on the web called uh, sisters in arms renee gagne that's her name um and uh it's kind of getting some traction on youtube it's doing pretty well that's awesome um but we are the uh we're the state's number one second amendment advocacy group we're the oldest the largest we've been doing this for the longest uh we're one of the only ones in the country that has a full-time staff and I think we're the only one in the country that has a full-time trainer. So uh, our charter is we do legislative advocacy. We're branching out into legal advocacy at this point. We're, we're starting to kind of dip our toes a little more in that water. We're going to start mounting some constitutional challenges to a lot of this stuff, mm-hmm. uh, especially if this bill passes with this kind of language. Um, but we also make sure that our members are trained. Uh, we offer a ton of training. We have a huge network of trainers. Um, we offer a ton of classes here, um, and we're just generally a resource for gun owners in Massachusetts who need advice, help, a way to advocate or advocate for themselves and for gun rights in Massachusetts. I mean, the staff is the staff. We try to do our best to be a clearinghouse for all the information and keep everybody updated, but goal is actually our members. I mean, we're... The members are the ones that actually get out there and do the work. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, we try to keep – uh, one of our big things is we try to keep people informed as possible, like like we have through our website. We yeah. have, you know, <laughs> probably 100-plus pages worth of, you know, white papers on what these bills do and what all these policies are and everything. So, uh, if you want to check it out, go to gold.org. It's only like 30 bucks for membership for the year. Nice. Um, and uh, – <clears throat> 
you know, <clears throat> you have us at your disposal as soon as you become a member, and we're always here, and we try to answer our phones as much as possible, and uh, just be here for the gun owning Massachusetts public. <laughs> and you guys are very responsive. Um, we try to be. It's it's hard sometimes. There's only four of us. I called and you guys got back to me right away. Oh, hey, so, cool. <laughs> so they're very awesome. responsive. We try. It, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been out of the office a lot going to, we've been testifying at hearings and stuff. And mm-hmm. I came home, I, I came in to the office like a couple of weeks ago to like 40 voicemails after the hearing. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so we try. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough, but we, we try to. Um, and then on the uh, on the rest of it, we, we put together you know informational resources and stuff but yeah we're just we're uh we're here for all things guns in massachusetts <laughs> it's it's the coolest gig i've ever had i love it but um uh, you know it would be nice to not to have to have it true if that but makes sense I, th- I think we're all we're all very thankful for you and the team here, right. over here at goal we do our best all right everybody that's mike harris he is the director of public policy at the gun owners action league massachusetts um thanks for listening and please share this there's so many people who don't know about this um this is an extremely important bill um that we need people to be aware of so thanks for tuning in and mike thank you again no thanks for having me